Hello Booktube. Today I'm going to be doing a discussion of Jane Finn's Hidden Sun. Um, now before I begin, I filmed this video or a video discussing Hidden Sun earlier and I didn't like it. Um, I got a little too wishy-washy in the discussion and I don't, I didn't like it. So I'm refilming this and I might hold this up again intermittently but I don't want to hold it up for the whole video so anyway so Hidden Sun is a really good book I greatly enjoyed it probably of the three books I've read so far in December it's my favorite but that said there is a very very hard subject that comes up towards the climax of the book is probably the climax of the book and it's a hard subject to deal with both in text and out of text so I will be talking about that in depth here in a few minutes but first before I begin I need to stress this is going to be very very spoilery so if you would like to read Hidden Sun um, even, uh, at some point, or if it's on your docket, your TBR list, or you're thinking of buying it and you don't want to be spoiled, um, yeah, I think maybe hold off on watching this video until after you've read the book. But I do recommend highly that you do by the book. It is a fantastic novel. So now, spoiler alert for the rest of the video. <clears throat> so basically, let's begin with world building. Um, so the world that the Hidden Sun takes place on in is one where the sun is significantly hotter than our own. Normal humans who are in this book called Shadowkin cannot live in unprotected in daylight. The sun is just too strong, too hot. Um, so humans, Shadowkin, live in basically reserves, preserves called Shadowlands, which are protected by some kind of um, object that the um, characters don't know. Possibly artificial, could be magical, that basically shades these preserves um, where humans can live relatively freely. I mean, they can live normally. <clears throat> and human... Earth typical animals, horses, can equally live comfortably in the Shadowlands. Outside of the Shadowlands, however, humans cannot live in daylight. If they travel openly, it has to be at night or cloudy days, or the sun's obstructed. Um, anyway, I mean, now, between these sort of... Um, human enclaves or Shadowkin enclaves, the Shadowlands, um, or is Skyland. <clears throat> now, while the Skylands are completely alien to, I mean, are completely alien, alien landscapes, there are humans who live there. Now, these humans called Skykin are altered humans. They're basically Shadowkin who have bonded with um, entities called animuses that transform them, evolve them, adapt them to better live in Skyland conditions. But before the bonding, um, Skykin are essentially Shadowkin and so have to be, have to live and be raised in the Shadowlands. And so they're raised in what are orphanage, essentially orphanages and 
schools, training them, teaching them how to be shadow, I mean, skykin, before they're eventually called to, uh, by adult skykin to undergo the bonding and become fully fledged skykin. Now, sometimes this bonding does not fully work and those skykin are called clanless. And all of this will be important in the book because the deuteragonist, the second point of view character, is a skykin who, whose bonding doesn't fully take. So anyway, now let's get on with the plot. So the main plot of the book is um, the story of Rhea Harlan. She's a countess uh, in the land of Shin. She's a noblewoman um, in relation to the Duke, who is the ruler of Shin, which is one of these Shadowlands. Her brother, and since Shin is a rather sexist place, it is inspired by a mix of um, East Asian and maybe Renaissance Italy, Italian influences. It is rather sexist, and her brother Etienne is the rightful or no rightful count of um yeah so he's gone missing he's been missing for months and she suspects he fled under nefarious purposes not necessarily a kidnapping but of his own actions um <clears throat> that she fears he was involved in the rape and murder of a young middle-class woman. And so when his location is found in a not quite rival Shadowland, she insists on going, that she wants to be there, she wants to talk to him first to find out what happened. Um, so she inserts herself in this company who are going to this distant Shadowland to find him. And eventually they find him, they rescue him, they become involved in multiple plots by other peoples. And eventually they return home to basically deal with her brother's antics, crimes, and the machinations of not only the Duke, but of other noble houses in Shin. Now, sort of that's Rhea, that's the primary uh, protagonist who, and another thing about her is that she's also a natural inquirer, a basically a scientist. Um, Ultimately, she is a female version of Galileo Galilei. Um, and that becomes very relevant in this book, in Hidden Sun, and plays a major role in the sequel, um, which came out, uh, which I picked up earlier, and will be in uh, a, uh, my next book haul. But anyway, getting back to... So, and her scientific inquiries become um, a recurrent subplot and hobby and distraction from the sort of the main plot. So the second narrator, or second point of view character is Dej. She is the young Skykin who is finishing up her education at one of the orphanage schools. And she doesn't like it there. She's a rebel, generally without a cause. She's got a bit of a bad attitude. <clears throat> I mean, she's one of those characters who are, I think, designed to be popular, but who are, yeah, I, I just, I have issues with them. So she's at this school and then she's suddenly thrust into becoming an adult Skykin. Um, 
she's one of three selected to undergo the bonding. As I said when I was introducing um, the Skykin, the bonding sometimes does not work, and it does not work with her. And so she is forced to become an outcast amongst the Skykin and join the outcast Skykin who are called the Clanless. Now, the Clanless are a nasty piece of, I mean, they're, basically Dej does not really belong with them. Um, th her roommates are, one of her roommates is an abusive jerk who is considerably worse than anyone she's actually had to deal with at school. Her, the other roommates, not necessarily as terrible, but not kind. The only member of the group that she, excuse me, or only two members of the band that she even remotely gets on well with, one of whom kind of is a bit more standoffish and really doesn't want much to do with her, and that's never really explained. Um, although, I guess her, she has a bit of a power that but uh, yeah, I mean it's pretty obvious why why she does not why Dej does not belong with the Skyken and then there's uh, Kal who is sort of their seer and who Dej is kind of attracted to but when she does have relations with him it's a very ugly experience not rape um, but it's just unsatisfying. It's, he's, Cal is not necessarily a very attentive lover, I guess you could say. And, and, I mean, obviously, of course, the whole reason why the Skykin are, or this clanless band of Skykin are pre depicted so negatively and why the one Skykin who was friendly without being revealed to be a jerk of the highest order like Cal is at best. I mean, he does eventually try to commit rape later in the book. So, is that um, basically when Dej crosses paths with Rhea and Etienne, towards the end of the book, she's, Dej has a choice. She can either side with the clanless, a people who have been nothing but shit to her since she's joined them, or she can basically help Rhea and Etienne who, while they have absolutely no reason to be kind to her at all, they did, she did participate in their kidnapping after all, um, she, they have been relatively nice to her. They saved her. They have, I mean, as much as they depended on her, she's also in a way depended on them. So ultimately that choice, which, uh, isn't really much of a choice at all. She sides with Rhea and Etienne and she is at least at this moment much happier. And I mean, in the sequel that will change. But anyway, and then there is the third narrator whose name I am blanking on. I want to say it's Shadak. I know it's Sadak. Um, um, Sadak is basically a... I mean, in the blurb, he's described as a cult leader. He's more of a cardinal or a local bishop pope. I mean, he's actually the supreme religious leader of Zet, which is the other um, the distant shadow land that um, Rhea and her group travel to. And he's I mean, he's interesting, he's sympathetic, but he's also basically a mad scientist. He's 
uh, dabbler in the science as much as Rhea is. Although while Rhea's is more astronomy, again, the parallel with Galileo, um, Sadak is um, more biological. He's seeking a way to somehow mine the sky can animus into a way to uh, produce an immortal. The um, Kaliarch, the leader of a sect, wishes to become immortal. And so his latest experiment involves four initiates of his order, and one of those initiates just happens to be Etienne Ria's previously ne'er do well brother. So, yeah. So that's how everybody ties together. Anyway, and that it's a very, very satisfying book. I actually rather love it. The journey, the political machinations, which may or may not have anything to do with what is what's on the surface. It's all very well done. But I mean, I do have some issues, obviously, when I was talking about Dej's narrative that obviously the reader is being manipulate, manipulated. Dej is being put into a position where, <clears throat> excuse me, um, her choice when her group of clanless have been um, hired to capture Etienne and bring him back to Zek that she's given a choice. Take them back to her clan or help them escape to Shin. She has no issue with really no internal struggle with helping Rhea and Etienne go back to Shin. It doesn't hurt that her and Etienne have a very strong mutual attraction, which uh, um, I mean again, I think that sort of at the end when that's touched upon and they act on it can raise some questions, but moving on. But I do think the hardest part of the book is ultimately the reason why Etienne fled Shin in the first place. Um, as I mentioned, there is a young woman, a uh, middle-class girl who was raped and murdered quite brutally and Rhea believes her brother is involved somehow um, and it is revealed that while Etienne did not commit the murder um, he did rape her and I'm not entirely sure whether that works. Um, on the one hand, it does put, put um, Rhea into an intense emotional ringer, which she has largely, to a degree, avoided through much of the book. Um, but at the same time, she... Yeah, I mean, it's... She also, I think, really handles it. I mean, there's an instance when she first learns it, when she's thinking her brother is about to die, that she utterly loathes him, that she wants to leave him to his fate. But at the same time, she also refuses to do so, that she does still love him, that she does forgive him this heinous crime he's committed. And it just, I mean, in 2019, I'm not entirely sure if how Finn handles these scenes necessarily work. Because uh, Etienne largely escapes punishment. Um, he does go into a form of self-exile, but ultimately he is considerably far happier at the end of the book 
than anybody, really. He basically gets what he wants, and it's, yeah, I mean, I'm not entirely sure this, that scene was handled very well. And then playing into the uh, Cal attempts to rape Rhea when after Etienne is believed dead and Rhea's alone in a cave waiting for rescue that, I mean, he does contemplate, I mean, Cal does threaten Rhea with rape, although she does get saved at the, in the nick of time. So, I'm not entirely, yeah, I'm, I'm not comfortable, I think, with how it was handled. Although, it, I mean, it, yeah, so I'm just, I'm not comfortable with how Finn handles it. Um, but I think besides that one part, which, I mean, of course, is the plot, I mean, primary plot of the book and the emotional climax, is, I mean, the book itself, I mean, it is a fantastic read. It is deeply interesting, deeply fun read. It's just, there's this one scene that I'm, or plot thread, that maybe doesn't really work. And possibly, I don't know if, like, Etienne deserves a greater amount of punishment, or... Well, I mean, he does. And, I mean, just, yeah, it, it kind of comes in, yeah, deeply troubling, I think. So, that was my thoughts of Hidden Sun by Jane Finn. Um, again, hopefully, um, I didn't waffle too much towards the end. I mean... I do have a hard time with the rape plot, um, and I mean, I don't, honestly, I don't think it was handled all that well. Um, I don't know if Etienne should have been more punished, uh, Rhea more vociferously condemn him, read him the riot act, or what? But, I mean, that it's just that, yeah. So anyway, so that's all I got for you today, BookTube. Thank you and goodbye.